Okay, you've watched all the videos. This is the last one. I just want to go over the test day schedule. Now, the night before your ACT test, you need to lay out your admissions ticket, your photo ID, your calculator, a watch, food, and water that you'll take with you, and number two pencils. This is so important. There, too often in my classes I've had students forget to take something to the ACT test day because they're trying to rush around Saturday morning to get things together. You don't want that stress. Just lay it out Friday night so you know where it's at. That way you, when you wake up Saturday morning you can just focus on having a nice good breakfast. You don't have to rush. You've got everything already organized and then you're ready to go to your test date. Remove that stress. One time I had a student he drove 45 minutes one way to my ACT class that met once a week for 14 weeks. He was a senior taking the December test and it was going to be his last opportunity to take it for the college he was considering. Saturday morning, for whatever reason, he could not find his, driver license, his driver's license and he ended up missing the test because of that. I don't want something like that to happen to you. Now, You've got to have a photo ID. So if you don't have a driver's license, you can have a high school student ID or you can have a passport. When my daughters were in middle school and took their tests, they didn't have any of that. So we had to take, get a special notarized form from the ACT website, go into the bank with a picture and have the bank notarize it. But make sure you've got some form of photo ID that is acceptable to the ACT test. One time I had a girl, she's going to use her driver's license. But the night before the ACT, she got pulled over for speeding and her driver's license was taken by the police officer to be used for her whatever. When you get a speeding ticket, they take your driver's license. Well, she had a ticket from the police officer. The next Saturday morning, she goes into the ACT and attempts to give the speeding ticket as evidence that she was who she said she was, but it didn't have her picture on it and she was not allowed to take the ACT test. You've got to have a photo ID. If you can't find your admissions ticket, you can log into your account at the ACT website and print out a new one and your admissions ticket should also have your photo on it. You, you download a photo to the website that is of you that they print automatically on the admissions ticket and that needs to be done I believe a week before your actual ACT test date. You need to take a calculator with you. They're not going to issue you calculators. You could, be, you could be at a high school taking the test. You could be in a math classroom. There could be a hundred calculators on the wall, it doesn't matter. They cannot take one off the wall and give it to you. You have to walk into the room with the calculator you will be using. Do me a favor if you have a graphing calculator and change the batteries the night before and then test it. One year in my June ACT test prep crash course, I had a girl who used my calculator all week. I always bring a bag of calculators to my live classes in case someone forgets to bring their calculator. And she had used my calculators because her graphing calculator batteries were dead. Well, the night before her ACT, she was changing the batteries in her graphing calculator while talking to her father. And she accidentally took out the dead batteries and put them back in, not realizing what she had done. But she never tested her calculator. So the day of the ACT test, she starts the math test, pulls out her calculator, and it's dead and she couldn't use it. I felt so sorry for her because her English reading and science scores went up but unfortunately her math score went down a little bit and that kept her from getting a 30 which was her goal on that test. Just change your batteries. Even if it doesn't say a low battery warning just go ahead and change your batteries. You're also allowed to take more than one calculator to the ACT test but you can only have one calculator on your desk. I don't know why having two on your desk would be an advantage because you only you can't do this with two hands but but that's the rules. I would take up a, back, a backup calculator just in case because you never know who might forget their calculator. I had a student one time who took an extra calculator and some kid at the test center had forgotten his and that kid's dad gave my student forty dollars to borrow maybe it was even to have maybe he bought the second calculator. Forty dollars for some little you know twenty dollar scientific calculator you can get at any store. Okay, So hey take it you never know you might make some money. You need to take a watch with you. The ACT will tell you when to start 
a test, they'll give you a five minute warning and they'll tell you when to stop. But there is no guarantee that there will be a wall clock in the room that you can see. Sometimes the wall clock will be behind you. You can't turn around and look at it. Or it could be on the wall to your left, but maybe you're right underneath it and you can't see it. Okay, You need to take a watch with you just in case. Now, in recent years, the ACT has gotten very picky on stopwatches. You can't walk in with a stopwatch you would use for track or swimming, but you can have a watch that has a stopwatch component like the one I'm wearing on my wrist right now. However, my watch beeps. For example, if I was going to start my timer, you might have heard that on the microphone. And if I stop it, it beeps again. And if I reset it, it beeps again. That used to be okay when taking the ACT test. It's not okay now. My watch should be illegal, and if it beeped during the test, I could be kicked out. However, it does help to have a stopwatch component. If you go to the Amazon's website and in the search engine put ACT silent watch, there is some company that makes a special watch just for the ACT test. And it's already got the times programmed in it. For example, my watch, it looks just like my watch, just a little bit different. In the top right button, you hit the mode button and it will switch to English, math, reading, science, writing. It's already got the times already set in them. So for example, for the English test, it's got 45 minutes set. When you hit the start, it starts doing a countdown and it makes no sound and the screen's a little big, little bigger so it's easier to see. That would be perfect. I think the watch is somewhere between $40 and $50. One Christmas, I, I bought all my daughters one of those for Christmas. They were so excited to get one of those ACT watches. I'm being sarcastic. But it would be a good gift to have to ha the day of the test. And you could always sell to someone who's younger than you when you are done actually taking your ACT test. But you need to walk in there with a watch. You need to take food and water with you. Do not assume there will be vending machines or something available for you. Um, sometimes at schools there will be drinking fountains, but if there's 100 kids taking the test and you only get a 10 minute break, not everybody's going to have a time to get a drink. You need to take healthy food with you, and this is important. You need to eat a, a good breakfast that morning, but a lot of times people don't eat as much when they're nervous. So they don't eat as much for breakfast as maybe they should. The ACT is mentally and physically exhausting, and, and, you, and people do get hungry during the test. So during that 10 minute break, take food that is healthy. I would take cold vegetables and cold fruits. Um, you could take some crap crackers. There's nothing wrong with taking a sandwich, but you don't want anything that's high in protein because protein-based foods take almost two hours to digest. Well, look at the schedule for a moment. In two hours, you're, you're at home and that food was useless for you. But cold vegetables and cold fruits, they break down within 20 minutes. So if you're eating them during the break, you're going to feel those natural sh sugars kick in during the reading test and then it will be sustained during the science test. That's ideal. You do not want things that are filled with a lot of processed sugar, like, like candy and, and candy bars, things of that nature. You should take water with you. I would, I would not take pop. I would not take high energy drinks because they give you that quick rush, but processed sugars burn faster and you go through a sugar withdrawal and you would feel that during the science test. You don't want that. Now, when you're at the test center, be careful of other people's food. I had a girl one time who was in my win winter spring classes and during that 14 weeks, she took the February ACT test. The February test is usually right around Valentine's Day. And the week after, she came back and she said, Jason, guess what I did? She goes, I took a ton of Valentine's Day candy to the test. And I said, why did you do that? I said not to take candy during the test. You shouldn't be eating candy during the break. That's ridiculous. And she looked at me and she goes, I didn't eat the candy. And I said, why did you take the candy? She goes, well, I remember what you said, how you shouldn't eat candy, it could hurt you, it causes sugar withdrawal, it doesn't help you. So I took a bunch of Valentine's Day candy and passed it out to the other students during the breaks. I figured that would hurt them and help me. I was like, wow, that's, that's evil. It's a good example why you don't take candy from strangers. And she was all excited for the National April Test. She took little Easter eggs filled up with jelly beans because jelly beans are loaded with sugar. Okay, don't eat candy. Eat things that are good for you and definitely take water take water for sure. You also need to take number two pencils.
A lot of high school kids use mechanical pencils. And if you're one of those kids that does, you know this. If you push down hard with a mechanical pencil, what happens? It, the lead breaks. So what happens is people who use mechanical pencils learn to write softly. Well, if you look at the bubble sheet that you used for the classes, you don't, it's not just about filling in the bubble. The bubble also has to be dark. There has to be enough graphite on the computer screen, on the computer sheet for the computer to pick it, pick it up. If computers make mistakes grading bubble sheets, usually it's because someone had a mechanical pencil and it was light. The high school that I used to teach at, we used to do quarterly standardized tests. And it was not uncommon for students to use mechanical pencils to have their test misgraded. So I started grading the, the test by hand as well as when the computer graded it just in case there was a mistake. And it seemed like every year one or two mistakes were made because someone used mechanical pencils. The ACT is very clear. You are not to use mechanical pencils. In fact, the proctors are supposed to check before the test is administered to make sure everyone has a number two pencil. But you should take one, a few of them just in case. I would also take some extra erasers. Okay, you got everything together and you're ready to go. Now, Depending on when you're taking the test, give yourself extra driving time. For example, in the Midwest, it seems like almost every other year the December test is administered, we have snowstorms in the Midwest. That's unfortunately not uncommon during that time of the year. And one year I had a girl who lived out in the country. She lived about, about 12 or so miles from her test center. But the night before, we got about a foot of snow. The ACT rarely cancels the test because when the test is given, it's given nationally and internationally. If we're having a snowstorm in Illinois, as an example, there's not a snowstorm in Florida. So if it's canceled in Illinois, that means the tests are going to be out in other parts of the country and that would give the students almost an unfair advantage. So they avoid that because if they have to cancel the test, it has to be rescheduled, a new test has to be given, and so forth. So they really try to avoid it as all possible. Well, Rose got scooped, but she woke up late that morning. She was in, in Illinois. If you live in the country, those are the last rubes that are shoveled by snow plows. And she was late. And she was driving too fast for conditions. She's about one block from the parking lot. She's just going to make it. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a dog runs right in front of her. She hits the dog with her truck. The dog goes rolling forward. But because she's late and now she's panicking, she, goes, she keeps driving and runs over the dog again and then turns right in the parking lot. When she got out of her truck, she told me that she could hear the dog on the road yelping, because <laughs> it's probably dying at that point. She starts crying. She rushes into the building. Now she's a little bit late. And the proctor said, that's okay, don't worry. She saw the girl was crying. She said, that's okay, don't worry about it. We were giving everybody a little more time to get here. But the girl was devastated. And the whole four hours she's taking the test, she's worried, did I kill that dog? She told me that as soon as the test was over, she ran outside, the dog was gone. But where the dog had been laying, there was blood all over the snow. How do you think she did on that test? She did not do well at all because she was distracted by what happened earlier. That's just one example if you, if you don't give yourself an extra driving time. Now, one year I had a student, it was the June ACT test, weather was great, but his dad was driving to the test center and all of a sudden they got a flat tire. But fortunately, they had left early because I give these suggestions in my classes and they had plenty of time to call another student that he knew was taking the test at the same place that student was able to come by, pick him up, take him to the test center. They weren't late, they weren't rushing, and it was okay. Just assume something's going to happen. Now, I want to bring up one other factor before we get into, the, get into the schedule. Let's say you wake up and you're sick. Not, not that you're nervous sick, that you really are sick. Don't take the test. Again, it's not just mentally draining, it is physically draining, and you know this. If you're sick, you're tired, your body needs a rest. It's, it's not worth it. The, if you miss the ACT test for whatever reason, you've got a two-week window to reschedule the test for another date. You do have to pay a small fee for it, 
but that's better than attempting to take the test when you're sick. I had a girl one year, she had, a, she had the flu all week prior to the December ACT test, didn't even go to school, wakes up that Saturday morning, convinces her mom she's okay, she can go take the test, she goes to the ACT, starts taking the test, and she is exhausted, she starts sweating really heavy, she is dehydrated. By the time the test ended, they had to take her to the emergency room and she was being filled up with a bunch of fluids with, via IV. She was worn out from having the flu. Well, what happened? Her composite score dropped two points. I'm surprised it didn't drop, drop more, but it dropped two points from the previous test. It's just not worth it. And, I, and every year, I, I'll have students call me a day or two, say, hey, I've been sick. What do you think? Should I take it? If you're calling me or emailing me to ask that, think about it. You've already answered your own question. You, you probably shouldn't take the test, and that's okay. And I understand there's disappointment. You spend all these months and weeks preparing for the test, and you really want to take it, but you got to keep everything in, in perspective. You need to be healthy when you're taking this test. Okay, let's say that you're healthy, and you're going to go take the test. Now let's go to the schedule. There's going to be about a 30-minute check-in, so you want to get there right around 7, 50 a.m. They got to do the photo ID, make sure you are who you say you are. The um, seating assignments are already set up. They give people time to get there. The proctor comes in to each room, reads directions and so forth. It's, it's quiet. Sometimes parents are even waiting out in the lobby area the whole four hours because they're nervous for their students. It's, it's just a very intense day, which is, which is a good thing. You have been preparing and you should want to compete. Well, everyone's in the test room. It's really quiet. The proctor's reading directions. No one is paying attention because everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. The last thing the proctor asks is, are there any questions? Usually no one has any questions. The proctor waits for a moment, lets the room get quiet, makes sure everyone's in the right spot, and then the proctor goes, go! And as soon as they say go, everyone rushes. Okay, they go super fast. Okay, and you know what happens when you rush? You miss things. You make mistakes. We talked about this in a previous session. When the proctor says go, don't go. Just sit there. Leave your pencil on the table. Count to 10. Let your mind relax. Again, as a reminder, this is how long 10 seconds is. That seems like forever when there's no sound. But we, we can all agree, you can give up 10 seconds during the English test. It lets your mind calm down, it lets you relax, it removes yourself from the race. We don't want to be racing during this test. You want to enjoy this test. If you got one of the I Love Taking Test shirts from one of my classes, wear this shirt, look down and say, I want to be here. I have prepared. I am ready for this test. Then start. Now again, English. English is the only test of the four that gives you plenty of time. It doesn't mean you can go slow and relax, but you have time to think about it, test choices. Remember, you're not reading these. You are grading them. So be picky. Test choices if you need to. Cross them out if you think they're wrong. Be physically active on the test. The more physically active on the you are on the test, crossing things out, circling things, math, doing picture steps and so forth, science, marking on the, ch the charts, graphs, and table, the more mentally engaged you will be. Remember, you got five passages in English. Treat each passage like it's someone's paper. And it's five different students. And you want to grade each one of them fairly by using the same intensity and focus for each one. The goal for English, as mentioned in previous sessions, is to finish it five minutes early. So you have a five minute buffer. That way, if you fall behind for whatever reason, you've got five minutes to catch up. If you want to go back and check some harder ones, you've got time to do that. But it also gives you time to relax before the math test. Going back to the schedule, the math test is the longest test time-wise, 60 minutes, one complete hour. Math is the only test that has no parts. Math is the only test of the four that goes easier to harder. And because of that, we've got to change our focus a little bit. When you get to question 20, pause for a moment. Check your time. You should be right around the 15 minute mark. You get the question 40. Pause for a moment. Check your time. You should be at the 35 minute mark. If you hit those marks, you don't, you don't need to worry about time. You're going to finish the time. If you're a little behind, that means when you get in the back 20, skip around. Make sure you do the easy ones first. Don't hesitate on questions. Get all the ones you, you know done first. 
then come back and worry about the harder questions on math. Remember, at the most, at the most, out of the 60 questions, there may be five that are advanced, really hard math questions. At the most, five. That means the other 55 or more can be solved using basic algebra and geometry. Again, using basic algebra and geometry. They'll make them look hard. They'll make them sound complicated. You know, there's a lot of reading on the math test. Don't be fooled. And again, there is a lot of reading on the math test, so make sure you know what they want. Cross out choices that don't make sense. Again, when you need to draw pictures, draw pictures. If it's a harder question, write down the steps for a moment. That way, if you make a mistake, you're more apt to catch it. Okay? But don't give in to the fear of the math test when, the, when it ends with some hard ones and, then, and don't start thinking that was your entire test. It's not. Remember, it's the first 40 on the math test that set up your score. It's the first 40 on the math test that are going to determine the, the vast majority of your points. The back 20 is a little bit different. It, it separates the exceptional from the great, the great from the good, the good from the average. Okay? But it's the first 40 that are important. Remember that. You go into a 10-minute break, you need to walk around. In fact, I would encourage you to, to stretch a little bit, swing your arms around a little bit, shake your legs out, because at that point you've been sitting almost two and a half hours. And we're sitting, our, our blood flow slows up, you need to get the blood moving again to help you get a little more energy. Eat. Even if you're not, hung, even if you're not hungry, eat. I've had students who told me they didn't eat during the 10-minute break, then you know, during the science test their, st their stomach starts growling, you can hear the noises. That's awkward. And you're not going to want that to happen during the test. Also, when you get tired, you get worn out, and it's, you're in an intense environment, blood sugar levels start to drop. And when they start to drop, we get more sluggish physically and mentally. So during the 10 minute break, again, eat the cold vegetables, eat the cold fruits, get some natural sugars in you, drink some water, use the restroom. And if you don't think you have to, use the restroom and relax. And realize you're more than halfway done. Look at the schedule for a moment. The break is not halftime. The first two tests are the longest tests. The first two tests have the most questions. After the break are the two short tests. This is good. The two tests before the break are ones where you have to come in, you have to know rules. You've got to know English rules. You've got to know math formulas and concepts. Okay? You've got to apply that knowledge. But the two tests after the break, they're different. You don't bring in anything to those tests. On both reading and science, the answers are in front of you. You just got to find them. If everyone had all the time in the world, they should get 80 out of 80 questions correct with those two tests combined. But that's the catch. The two tests after the break are designed so that over half the people in the country don't finish them. English and math aren't designed that way. English gives you plenty of extra time, and math gives you extra time but that will, and the, the amount of extra time you'll have for math will depend on your mathematical abilities. But reading and science aren't designed that way. So when that break ends, you need to be focused or ready to start on reading right away. You've got to read at their pace. Three and a half minutes for a passage. Five minutes for a question set. Okay? At least 15 seconds for bubbling. Remember that one of the four passages is going to be a passage split. It could be the first one, which is prose fiction. The second one, social science. The third one, humanities. Or the fourth one, natural science. Then when you get to the five minute break on reading, remember you should be on the last set of questions. When reading ends, you've only got about a 30 second gap before science starts, but when reading ends, it's over. Do not let what happened in reading affect science. When science starts, remember it's going to be material unlike anything we saw in class, and that's okay. That means the science test is fair. They always change the science material, so it's different for every test that's given, but remember, all the answers are right there. So when you're taking the science test, okay, remember it could be a six passage layout or a seven passage layout. If it's a seven passage layout, like the ones we practice with, then that means you're five minutes per passage. If it's a six passage layout, you'll have five minutes and 50 seconds per passage. If it's a six passage layout, that means you'll have two data rep question, passages with six questions each. If it's a seven passage layout, you'll have three data rep passages with five questions each. Remember, the data rep ones are the easier ones. Okay, Less information because it tends to focus on one study and less questions. The other type is research summary. Regardless of the layout, there will be three research summary passages. 
Now, if it's a six patches layout, there'll be seven research summary questions. If it's a seven patches layout, there'll be six research summary questions. The only difference between a research summary and a data rep passage is that a research summary tends to be on one really detailed study or it tends to cover multiple studies. And it has one more question than a data rep. But data rep and research summary, remember you have the same approach. Start with the questions, start with the questions, start with the questions. The third type of passage is the conflicting viewpoint. That's the one that is theory based, so you have to read it first. As we talked about in the sessions, when you find that one, I would skip it and do it last because there are advantages to doing the conflicting viewpoint passage last. One, you're coming off the reading test. There's only about a 30 second break between reading and science. Again, do the easy ones first. Also, it keeps you in the flow. Data rep and research summary have that same approach. Start with the questions, start with the questions, start with the questions. Again, you want to stay in that flow. Having done this for many years, I can tell you that nationally, when the conflicting viewpoint is the second, third, or fourth passage, scores tend to be lower. And I think it's because it throws people off. You do an easy one, you flip to the hard one, the conflicting viewpoint, and you flip back to the easy ones again. When you do the same thing over and over and over again, you get into a flow and you naturally start speeding up. It's like sports, like practicing a musical instrument. When you do drills over and over and over again, you naturally get faster at those particular drills. We can do the same thing by doing the conflicting viewpoint last, getting all the other ones out of the way first, and then end with the conflicting viewpoint. The last reason and the most important reason why you want to do the conflicting viewpoint last is because of time. If you can finish the data rep and research summary ones a little bit early, say, say 20 seconds on average, 20 seconds by itself is not that much time. But multiply that by six, that's two extra minutes. That's a big deal. And usually conflicting viewpoint can use an extra time, extra time because of that reading component. So let's say you had seven minutes for conflicting viewpoint. That means you would hear the five minute warning while you're doing the conflicting viewpoint. Then when the conflicting viewpoint is done, your ACT test is over. Now, I want to review bubbling for a moment. We talked about the bubbling sheet. Here's a copy of one right here. There isn't anything on this bubbling sheet that's going to help you for the test. It's blank. There's no math formulas. There's no questions. There's no choices. But it does need to be filled out correctly. However, we want to spend the least amount of time as possible on this sheet. So like we practiced in class, circle your answers in your test booklet. Keep your eyes energy on your test booklet. That's where the questions are. That's where the choices are. That allows you to skip around, cross out, you know, go back and forth the race if you need to. This bubble sheet, it's not even made for racing. It's made for your final answers. But again, it does need to be filled out correctly. We know that English, reading, and science, those tests are broken up into passages. So like we practiced in class, after you finish a passage, stop, take a moment, and go bubble all the answers for that particular passage. Bubbling in groups is faster than going back and forth, back and forth. It's also more efficient mentally. You're going answer, 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 stop. You're bubbling, which needs to be done, but bubbling is not near as mentally stressful as looking for answers. The third and most important reason why you want to bubble in groups is it's bubbling in groups is a natural checking system. If you get off on the bubbling, you'll know it right away, you can fix it right away, and you only have to check the section you just did as opposed to the entire test. Now, when the proctor says the five minute warning for all four tests, start bubbling back and forth, back and forth. They may say five minutes, but maybe it's say really only four minutes, or you may lose track of time. You wanna make sure you get all your answers possible on your bubble sheet. And when they say stop, drop your pencil. I know of three of my former students who have been kicked out of the ACT because they were bubbling the say question 40 on science they said stop and they finished the bubble and didn't drop the pencil right away some proctors are really really mean so just make sure you follow the directions now when your science test is over and, you're, and if you're not doing the writing you're done you should be out a little before noon of that day enjoy your day now if you are doing the writing option if you look at the screen for a moment you'll have a five minute break during the five minute break, that gives an opportunity for those who are not doing the writing test to leave the building. Once everybody's out of the building, then the writing option will begin. You'll have 40, 40 minutes and they'll also give you a five minute warning. When the writing ends, 
then you are done as well. You should be done at that point right around 12.45, 12.50 p.m. Enjoy your day and relax. You've earned it. Now, I also want to take a moment to talk a little bit about sleep. Sometimes the night before the ACT, students have a, a tough time sleeping for whatever reason. People get nervous. They're, they're excited, and that's, that's a good thing. It doesn't really matter how you sleep the night before as long as you've got a good night's sleep on Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, and Monday. Sleep is a cumulative. Also, Friday night before the test, treat it like a school night. I want to study past 7 p.m. for the ACT, let your mind relax, but, but don't go out and be doing a bunch of things with your friends that keep you out late at night which would make you tired for the next day. I had a girl one time when I taught in the public schools, she was in my fall classes during her senior year. She was taking the December test. It would be her last time taking the test. And the week after the December test, she was one of my students and I found out she had been exhausted during the ACT test and I asked why. Well, she told me she'd been out the night before with her friends. I said, well, how, how late were you out? I think she said she was out like two or three o'clock in the morning. That's ridiculous. I said, why were you out so late? She goes, well, I wanted to spend time with my friends. I said, were your friends taking the ACT test? She goes, no. I go, well, it's okay for them to be out, but you had a big test. Well, didn't seem like a big deal to her, but her ACT score didn't end up being what she wanted it to be or needed it to be. See, that senior graduated from high school early, right after our fall semester, right after Christmas break. And she was planning on going to college in North Carolina. Well, she found out right after Christmas break, she needed one, her ACT score was one point short. One point short. She would have easily gotten the score she needed had she not been out with her friends, but she blew it. And what boggles my mind is she spent three months in my class getting ready for that test. But because she couldn't say no to her friends about going out at night, she blew it. Don't blow it. You've been preparing for this test. It's a big deal. Remember, when you're taking that test, you're not competing against the students in your school. You're not competing just against the students in your state. You're not just competing against the students in the country. You are competing against the world, and that requires your best. So Friday, you know, review some things. Don't do anything past 7 p.m. that night. Relax, get a good night's sleep, get up the next day, eat a good, good breakfast, and then go and perform. The ACT is very good about getting their, their test scored very quickly. The score should be online 10 days after your test. So not the Tuesday after your test, but the second Tuesday after your test. When your scores come in, email me. I want to know how you did. I know how hard you worked and you reap what you sow. And I want to know what you were able to accomplish. Mm -hmm.